great, you know, to be and an, an honour to, to be asked in Edinburgh. So let's begin. From the firing on Fort Sumter on the 12th of April 1861 until Joseph E. Johnson's surrender to Sherman on the 26th of April 1865, the fledgling United States was immersed in a bloodbath of civil war. The sheer scale of this war dwarfed anything that the American people had witnessed before. One South Carolina observer wrote in 1863, the world has never saw such a war. Historian Drew Gilpin Faust wrote that approximately 2.1 million northerners and 880,000 southerners took up arms. In the south, three out of every four white military-aged males were in the army. Now the South experienced the worst of the fighting. Most of the fighting took place within the southern borders, especially around the border states. And this was a conflict that for the first time brought the atrocities and the horrors of war to the doorstep of civilians. The North employed a scorched earth policy and it was adapted by the unions. They burnt farms, they burnt cities, they raised them to the ground, they destroyed factories, and they didn't discriminate between military and civilian targets. In a letter to Union Commanding General Ulysses S. Grant, dated the 9th of October 1864, General William Tecumseh Sherman wrote, The utter destruction of its roads, this is the South, the utter destruction of its roads, houses and people will cripple their military resources. By attempting to hold these roads, we will lose a thousand men monthly, and I will gain no result. I can march and make Georgia howl. Make Georgia howl. This was a war that would be ever associated with some of the greatest Americans of all time in history. Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, George Armstrong Custer, and the subject of our lecture today, Robert E. Lee. So who was Robert E. Lee? And this is a question that many historians have attempted to unravel over the years. A multitude of books, and articles, and documentaries have been penned over the years about Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee, the great general. Robert E. Lee, the Virginian. Robert E. Lee and his moral fortitude. To some, Robert E. Lee is a hero. Historian William C. Davis described Lee as Virginia's and his, Virginian history's greatest uh, Virginian, only ranked second behind George Washington. But to others, Lee was nothing more than a rebel, a traitor. Republican and Union supporters judged John, Judge John Curtis Underwood became a protagonist in the North to pour out Northern retribution after the war. He went after Lee and indicted him for treason against the United States of America. And he did everything that was in his power to bring, bring Lee to trial. The African American abolitionist Frederick Douglass wrote after Lee's death in 1870, we can scarcely take up a newspaper that is not filled with the nuancing flatteries of Lee from which I would sing that the soldier who kills the most men in battle, even in a bad cause, is the greatest Christian and entitled to the highest place in heaven. But yet even today, the debate over Robert E. Lee continues. Today in America, there's a controversy over the removal of Confederate war memorials, memorials and statues that include Robert E. Lee. Some argue that these uh, statues are a symbol of oppression and racial hatred. Others in the Confederacy argue that they are a way to remember the dead of the South, the soldiers that fought for the South with dignity and respect. But what I would say today is Robert E. Lee was a very complicated individual. He was a man of many layers. He was guarded in his thoughts, 
He kept his words carefully close to his chest. And I'm not going to presume today to give a definitive answer about this question. Who was Robert E. Lee? Because it's above my pay grade. However, as we journey together, I would hope that as we look at Robert E. Lee's life, that I'll add something to this debate. And that you'll enjoy what you hear about one of America's greatest figures during the 19th century. I'm reminded of the little signs in the shops that say, if you see anything and you enjoy it, we'll tell someone else. And then it goes on to say, and if you don't, please for goodness sake, don't tell anyone. So that's what I would hope today. I would hope that you enjoy what we are hearing today. So Robert Edward Lee was born on the 19th of January, 1807. He was a middle child, the fourth son of Henry Lee and his wife, Anne Hill Carter Lee. Lee was born at Stratford Hall, his ancestral home, situated overlooking the Potomac River in Virginia. Now Thomas Lee was an English man. He was the founder of the Lee dynasty in Virginia. In 1734, he commenced work on Stratford Hall and he named it after his grandfather's estate in England. Now, Thomas was a businessman. And in 1744, he played a fundamental role in creating an English settlement in the Ohio Valley. He later formed the Ohio Trading Company. And this was not a total financial success. However, it embraced this spirit of westward expansion that would later grip the United States of America. Thomas Lee made his uh, fortune in tobacco and land speculation. He owned more than 16,000 acres in Virginia and Maryland. He was a slave owner and he played a leading role in the Virginian colony. At his death in 1750, he had rose to the position of acting governor of Virginia. Stratford Hall is a plantation and it was eventually passed to Thomas's eldest daughter, Matilda. Matilda Lee had no trouble adapting to her new married name when she married her cousin, Light Horse Harry Lee. They were both called Lee. They believed in keeping it in the family. In 1790, Matilda died and left Stratford Hall and its plantation and grounds to her husband, Henry. Three years later, in 1793, Henry Lee married his second wife, Anne Carter Hill. This was Robert Lee's mother. Lighthouse Harry Lee has been said that Robert E. Lee was the closest thing uh, about uh, Virginia royalty. Lee was born into one of the most noblest families in the state. Lee's father, Henry, was a Revolutionary War hero. In 1776, Henry accepted a captain's commission in the Continental Army, serving in the Virginia Dragoons. Lee rose to the rank of Major in 1777, and by 1780 he was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, or as they say in America, Lieutenant Colonel. Henry Lee distinguished himself as a soldier, earning the name Light Horse Harry Lee and won a medal from the Continental Congress. Should be added that before he was awarded his medal, he was court-martialed, however found not guilty. After the war, Lee entered politics and he served as a delegate in the Congress for Virginia and Governor of Virginia. Henry Lee's business <coughs> ventures were not so esteemed. He was reckless in business and he invested his money poorly. He took out loans that he could not repay. And Robert E. Lee's mother also came from one of Virginia's finest families. Her grandfather, Robert, became a powerf so powerful that he was known as, the King, uh, known as King Carter. Anne Hill Carter Lee was from one of Virginia's wealthiest families. Her father, Charles, lived on the Shirley Plantation, situated on the James River near Richmond. Anne's father 
was aware of light horse Harry Lee's reckless nature and he imposed their marriage. Anne's marriage to light horse Harry Lee was looked and frowned upon by her family. But the wedding took place at Shirley on June 18, 1793. Although consenting to the marriage, Charles did everything he could to ensure that Lee would not touch any of Anne's inheritance. But by this time, in Robert E. Lee's birth, his father Henry was in dire financial trouble. By 1809, he was twice imprisoned for debt. Anne Carter Lee was living in poverty. Her father left no provision for Anne in his will when he died. Perhaps this was uh, due to her husband, and he didn't want Henry benefiting from Anne Carter Lee's money. Anne's health was failing. She was living in one room in Stratford Hall. All her servants were gone. She was struggling to provide heat and food for her family. The once proud Anne Carter Lee from the Shirley Plantation was reduced to bringing her husband food to prison. Her family offered to take her in, both her and her children. But Anne, being this proud southern woman that she was, refused their charity and elected to stay with her husband. When Henry Lee was released from prison, he lost everything, including his family home at Stratford Hall. Anne stayed with him, but insisted that they would move to a rented house in Alexandria, where she was surrounded by her family. The house they lived in was owned by one of Lee's other relations, William Henry Fitzhugh, who was the young Robert E. Lee, uh, who the young Robert E. Lee called uncle. Fitzhugh's sister Mary was mother to Robert E. Lee's future wife, Mary Custis Lee. Perhaps you're seeing a pattern of intermarriage here, keeping it in the family. And I suppose on a caveat in that, the, the Lees were of noble birth, blue blood, plantation people. There wasn't that many of them around at that time. And great families would often intermarry. And it was a way of keeping the money and the breeding together. Author David Cox wrote that Anne pleaded with her husband to act responsibly as a affected fatherless wife who now could only look to you this is her husband henry to smooth her rugged path through life and soften her bed of death robert e lee would later remember that his father moved his family to alexandria to further their children's education and this is the sanitized version of the story that has been adopted by many of the earlier historians those who write about Lee and say that he can do no wrong. They neatly brush light horse Harry Lee's escapades and field business ventures underneath the carpet. They neatly forget about his debt and his time in prison. Anne's pleas to her husband fell on death ears. And in 1812, light horse Harry Lee found himself in difficulty once more. Lee's father was by political conviction a Whig the Whig Party. Robert E. Lee was careful never to make known his political, uh, his political sentiments, and for a lifetime he held them close to his chest. But William C. Davis asserts that whatever little evidence there is that exists would suggest that Robert E. Lee, like his father, was a Whig. Lee's father believed in strong federal government. He believed in the union of the states. And it may come to a shock to most of you here today that Robert E. Lee also believed in the union. He was a strong federalist. He believed in the federal government. Lee desired never to dissolve the union. He was not a secessionist. And he considered those who called for secession as extremists. In December 16, or 1860, sorry, Lee said that secession was nothing more than revolution. But in 1861, Robert E. Lee was faced with a terrible dilemma of conscience to side with his beloved Union or his home state of Virginia. Henry Lee found himself in 1812 in an equally 
pressing dilemma. Lee, as a Whig, opposed President James Madison in America's second great war with Britain. Does anybody know what that was called? Did you know that America fought twice with Britain? No. In 1812, uh, America declared war on Great Britain once again. And this actually resulted in the British burning the White House. But on the 27th of July, Henry was visiting a like-minded friend in Baltimore who was a newspaper owner. He had been critical of the War of 1812 and he had been critical of Jackson and President James Madison. A mob gathered outside his house. And it was only dispersed when the militia was called. Lee and his friends were taken into protective custody into the local jail for their own safety where the men were guarded night and day by members of the local militia. The next night, however, another riotous mob surrounded the jail. The militia men disappeared into the night, whereupon the rioters stormed the jailhouse and attacked Lee and his friends. These rioters slashed Lee's face and poured hot candle wax into his eyes in an effort to blind him. They continued to beat Lee and his friends into a bloody pulp, incurring serious injury. And they only stopped when they believed that they were dead. But Henry Lee survived, but never fully recovered from this frenzied attack in 1813. In 1813, Robert E. Lee's father abandoned his family. He left for Barbados. Henry would argue that he left for the good of his health. However, many believe that he was running from his creditors. Bit of a cad, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Anne Carter Lee. Robert E. Lee was only six years of age when his father abandoned his mother and children. He would never see his father again. Anne Carter Lee was left in Alexandria to provide for her children by herself. Her husband sent letters, but this was the only contact that he had with his wife and children. Lee's mother was a fragile woman. She was in poor health. She was to all intents and purposes an invalid. The young Robert E. Lee had to grow up quickly. By age 11, he learned that his father had died. Lee had tried to make his way home when he realised he was dying, however, never made it. Lee biographer William Jones wrote about Lee. The boy was old beyond his years. Lee's mother had a great influence on him growing up. She taught him about the importance of self-denial. She taught him about self-control. And his father also wrote to his family about the importance of duty and personal honour. Perhaps Light Horse Harry Lee didn't always practice what he preached. Their financial struggles also taught Lee to be frugal and manage his money well. By all accounts, Lee was a methodical, serious young man and applied himself well to his schoolwork. In 1824, Lee received tuition in mathematics to prepare him for his entrance exam into the West Point Military Academy. West Point training was the, the cream of America's officers class. And although it was a military academy, the most important subject on the curriculum in West Point wasn't soldiering, but mathematics. Everything was based around mathematics. Lee was very attentive to his mother and nursed her. His mother described him as both her son and her daughter. This was a time defined by gender roles when daughters nursed their aging parents. Lee's mother was also a committed evangelical Christian and her faith was very important to her. She prayed fervently that Robert E. Lee would also find that same loving, meaningful faith that she too had experienced. And faith would later play a great role 
in Lee's life. When living in Alexandria, his family attended Christ Church, Episcopalian Church. It was there that the young Lee met the Reverend William Mead, who rose through the Episcopalian Church to become one of its bishops. Mead was a radical for his time, and he induced reform throughout the Episcopalian denomination in America. Reed also, or Mead, sorry, was also uh, against slavery. And his views would play a particular way in shaping young Robert's mind. Mead was also a father figure to Lee. Mead was the priest that presided over Lee's wedding. Mead was the godfather to his future wife, Mary Custis. And Mead would ask to speak to Lee for one last time on his deathbed in 1862. And this final meeting with, with Mead had a profound emotional effect on Robert E. Lee. In 1824, uh, William Henry Fitzhugh, Lee's adopted uncle, wrote to the Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun, and helped secure Lee a place in West Point. Lee was 18 years of age. Lee embraced life in West Point well, and he was noted as a model cadet. He never received a single demerit during his time there. Lee graduated West Point second in his class and was posted to the Corps of Engineer with the rank of second lieutenant. It was also at West Point that he was dubbed the Marble Man. The story goes that one of his classmates saw him riding past a remark that he was like a marble man sitting upon his horse. Perhaps it was here that the myth of Robert E. Lee's embodiment of the perfect man was born. A myth that was based on his honour code, his Christian values and his self-control. But it could also be suggested that Lee had already experienced a lot of life in his first 11 years. The abandonment and death of his father, although there's no record of how Lee's father's death affected him. He had witnessed the fall of his family from one of Virginia's elite planter class to living hand to mouth in a rented house. Lee had nursed his sickly mother and by all accounts he had ran their household. These are all events that must have shaped the young Robert E. Lee to some extent. Moreover, it could be argued that West Point was Lee's chance to regain some of his family's honour. The honour that his father had frittered away. In public, Lee was extremely formal, a marble man. But this was his failed safe position. This was his way of dealing and coping with whatever was going on around him. This was Robert E. Lee's way of staying in control. Robert E. Lee was very different in his private life. And to those that knew Lee, to those that were closest to him, they got to see who was the real Robert E. Lee. The handsome 24 year old second lieutenant set its sights upon Anne Randolph Custis, the daughter of John Park Custis and Mary Fitzhugh Custis. Mary Custis was a childhood friend of young Robert. In fact, she was his second cousin. Here we go again. By 1830, she was the most eligible belle in Virginia and had many suitors knocking at her door. His father was grandson, and this is where a PowerPoint would have helped because it's particularly messy to work out their family. There are that many twists and turns. But his, her father was grandson to Martha Washington. We all know who Martha Washington was, yes? George Washington's second wife. And Washington had taken the young John Custis in and raised him as his own son. Washington doted on the boy. And John Custis, or John Park Custis, was known throughout Virginia as having most of Washington's relics. 
and would tell stories at his dinner party about John or George Washington. The connection with George Washington uh, was, uh, was a practical one for Robert E. Lee as well. Because Mary Custis was at the pinnacle of high society. She was a bit plain, but she was free spirit. She was fun loving. She was intelligent. She got usually what she wanted. But Lee had a few obstacles to her hand. He had to overcome a few things to win young Mary Custis' hand. Lee was as we said, rightfully, of planter's stock, but he had no money. Mary Custis, on the other hand, was an heiress and would inherit her father's Arlington estate upon his passing. Lee had a second problem to deal with. Mary Custis had found God, just like Lee's mother, both Mary Custis' mother, and now Mary herself, on the 4th of July, 1830, had embraced the evangelical fever that was spreading across America. It would be called the Second Great Awakening. And the young socialite had undergone a life-changing spiritual conversion. So Mary's dilemma in 1830 was that did she have enough room in her heart for both God and the young Robert E. Lee? With that said, Mary was forming an attachment, a close attachment to Robert. And he set about trying to converse her, convince her to marry him. While young Mary set about trying to convert Robert to her way of thinking. Mary wrote in her diary, O oh, draw him also to thee, that we may with one heart, one mind live to the glory of our Redeemer. Young Robert had other ideas in his head. He had become rather dashing and he was a bit of a hit with the ladies. He loved dancing, he loved gaiety. He was counted uh, and continued to be as a bit of a flirt. Robert was off on his military duty and he sent Mary Custis some beautifully written love letters. Lee was thinking about romance Mary Crustis replied to Lee by sending him transcripts of sermons. I'm sure he was very happy. Tentatively, Mary Custis gave in to Robert's way, and they were married in the front parlour of Arlington House in 1831. However, Robert would soon learn that there was only one general in the Lee household, and that she wore a skirt. Lee may have rose to the rank of commanding general of the, of the Confederacy, but Mary Custis Lee was the only general who gave the orders in the Lee household. I used to be a professional mediator, and during my training, my mentor asked one day, had anyone in the, 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 the room, were they going to get married shortly, or had been married shortly? And a few young men put their hands up. And the man said, well, I'm going to give you a mediation technique that will give you a peaceful and happy marriage. I've been married, he says, for 30 years, and it has never failed me. He told the young men, there's two little words that you need to learn to sort out your marriage. They're simply, yes, dear. <laughs> and Robert E. Lee learned the words, yes, dear, quite often to marry. By 1860, it was clear that America was hurtling towards war between the states. Between the South, who was pro-slavery and wanted to extend slavery into the new Western territories, and most of the Northern states that did not. The folks, as I stopped before when I was here, please remember that all the states in the Union were not all anti-slavery. There was a number of states within the Union that were pro-slavery and indeed had slavery as an institution at the beginning of the war. But Robert E. Lee was faced with an agonizing decision. Would he remain in the U.S. Army and fight to preserve the Union? 
or would he resign his commission and fight for his native state of Virginia? Should he succeed from the Union? Lee found himself in the middle. He was stuck in the middle. Lee was part of a small elite officer corps in the United States Army. This band of brothers tended to remain very silent in matters regarding politics. The rule was to soldier. The advancement in the US Army was very slow. It was a small army. And if someone allowed their political, op uh, political persuasions to be released and made public, it would hinder promotion. Robert E. Lee was no different and played his political cards extremely close to his chest. On the 28th of March, 1861, Lee had just received a commission signed by President Abraham Lincoln that promoted him to Colonel of the 1st Cavalry. This was Lee's dream job. But at the same time, Lee also received overtures from Leroy Pope Walker, the Secretary of War for the Confederate States of America, who offered him the rank of Brigadier General. Lee did not even answer the Confederate States of America. And it should be noted that Lee had no allegiance to the Confederate cause, nor the Confederate States of America at this time. Lee had two loyalties. The first was to the United States of America, and the second was to his home state of Virginia. On the 12th of April, 1861, PGT Beauregard, I'll try and say that with my full teeth, led the Confederate forces that fired on Fort Sumter. And these were the first shots of the American Civil War. In response to this action, Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteer troops to put down, as he put it, the rebellion. Now this is very important. The federal government did not consider the Civil War a civil war, but a rebellion. And the official name for the Civil War is the War of the Rebellion. Robert E. Lee was requested to attend a meeting with Francis Preston Blair on the 17th of April. And Blair had been authorized by Abraham Lincoln to offer Lee the position of Major General of this volunteer army. He had been given permission to ask Lee to suppress this rebellion in the South. Lee had already proved his work and worth in suppressing rebellions. Lee was the officer in charge of, of, of squashing John Brown at his raid in Harpers Ferry on the 17th of October, 1859. And I often think back to that time and would argue that this is where the Civil War really started, in Harpers Ferry in 1859. There we have John Brown, we have Robert E. Lee, we have Jeb Stewart, who little be, later become the Cavalry General during the Civil War. We even have Stonewall Jackson who attended the hanging of Brown to offer security for the day. But Lee respectfully declined Blair's offer and is reported to have told him, Mr. Blair, I look upon secession as anarchy. If I owned the four millions of slaves in the South, I would sacrifice them all to the Union. But how can I draw my sword upon Virginia, my native state. Lee could not draw his sword against his own people. But who were his own people? Lee still regarded himself as part of this old planter class. In the 19th century, breeding was everything. And he believed that class was very important. That the class of man and the breeding of a man was important for government. He considered many of the politicians arguing for war on both sides as nothing more than new money. Who did not have the breeding 
to lead. Lee said, the lower classes are a noisy, swaggering set. Lee also said about politicians that they were the most difficult to cure of all insane people. He also said about politicians that they were too selfish to be martyrs. Maybe old Bobby Lee knew something about politicians. But either way, Robert E. Lee was in an impossible situation. Politically, he was a Federalist who wanted to preserve the Union. Professionally, he was a commissioned officer in the United States Army, sworn to protect the Union and his company, country. But equally so, he was a Virginian who believed that his first allegiance was to his people, was to his state. How could Robert E. Lee lead 75 troops in an invasion of the South against his own people, against his own family, against his own friends? Lee also knew by siding with the secessionists that he stood to lose everything. His commission in the army, his home at Arlington House, and many of his dear friends and comrades in the North. Lee went directly from the meeting with Blair to see General Winfield Scott. The old general was like a father to Lee and a fellow Virginian. He expressed and hoped that Virginia would not succeed. And he told Scott that he would hope to stay in the army. He also told Scott that in the event of Virginia succeeding, that he could be posted or positioned in a duty that would not cause him to raise his sword against the South. Winfield Scott made it very clear to Lee that if he was to stay in the army, he was expected to do his full duty. And this would also mean leading troops to invade the South. When Lee returned home, he remarked, I presume the poor old state will go out. I don't think she need to do so, yet at least but so many are trying to push out that she will have to go, I suppose. Much has been made over the years in the history books about the agonizing night that Lee spent before he resigned his commission in the United States Army. It is said that he was heard pacing up and, up and down in a study above, deliberating what would go on and what he would do. David Cox wrote that hearing the news of rioting in Baltimore on the 19th of April, Lee gathered his family in his office. Seated at his office desk, he read, him, read them his, registration, his, his resignation letter from the army. Cox wrote that no one in the room said a word. Lee broke the silence and said, I suppose you all think I have done very wrong, but it had to come to this. And after my last interview with General Scott, I felt <coughs> that, I, that I could hold off no longer. Cox wrote that upon hearing the news, General Winifred Scott took to his office sofa and refused to see anyone that day. Lee was like a son. To him. The general demanded his staff not ever to mention Robert E. Lee's name in his presence again because he could not bear to hear it. Lee's sense of honour would not allow him to do what most he wanted, and that was to stay in the United States Army. His sense of honour would not allow him to follow his political convictions to preserve the Union. And lastly, his sense of honour would not lead him down the path of personal sacrifice and loss. At the beginning of the war, Lee was said to have a full head of black hair. He was very striking looking and in good health. Pictures taken directly after the war show an old man staring back at the lens, his health shaken and battered. In 1863, just before the Battle of Chancellorsville, Lee took what some think now is, was a heart attack. 
Lee's, Lee battled with his heart for the rest of his life. And it was his heart and heart disease that took him in the end. Civil War author Frank O'Reilly stated that Robert E. Lee lived a dignified life and died a very dignified death. He died with dignity. And this is something that very few people have the opportunity to do. Robert E. Lee's last words were strike the tent. And with that he slipped away into eternity. He had a vibrant Christian living faith and didn't fear death. Yet in some way Lee lives on on the pages of history. Lee has become immortal throughout the years. People still talk today about Robert E. Lee. People are still debating about Robert E. Lee. Is he a hero? Is he a villain? People are still looking to Robert Edward Lee, the Marble Man. Thank you very much. If you don't mind, we're going to show you something here. If, if it's okay for time, is that okay? Yes? Quickly, questions. Just does anybody want to throw any questions to me? Do we see during the Civil War, yes. how, how did people in Mosia involved and commanding the armies? Or was it more sort of a, an executive commander? Right. Executive head of the South. Uh, Lee's, Lee's best, greatest victory was at Chancellorsville. Does anybody know anything about the Battle of Chancellorsville? No. It's actually still taught in military uh, academies today. Uh, Lee was at Fredericksburg, okay, and uh, General Hooker had the Army of the Potomac. And he crossed over the Potomac River and was facing directly to the front of Fredericksburg. However, Lee was a strategist and he worked out that this was a feint. So he left, I think it was 10,000 men at Fredericksburg. And he marched with uh, General Jackson. Do you know who he is? Yeah, Thomas Jackson, Stonewall Jackson. He marched frantically up to the west, to the wilderness. Later on, there would be a battle fought there as well called the Battle of the Wilderness. I'm getting to your answer here quickly. He took something like 13,000 men with him and stayed there. Jackson then marched frantically to the right flank of the Union Army. He found the right flank and they had no idea of where the Union Army was but they found the right flank and Jackson knew that if he could turn the right flank that they could decimate the Federals. So to answer your question is this, on the first day of the Battle of Chancellorsville, when, uh, when Jackson engaged Hooker's men, Lee was left <coughs> to hold off the remaining Federals. And it's said that Lee acted as a, as a general, that Lee rode up and down the lines, he acted as a corps commander, pushing corps in. He acted as a brigade commander, and at one point he was even acting as an artillery commander commanding the batteries. If you look at the, uh, at the Civil War, there's an unusual amount of officers who end up being killed, an unusual amount of generals who end up being killed. And it's said that at Chancellorsville, Lee sat on his horse as the cannonade burst around him. And his favourite horse was called Traveller, and it said that the very ground underneath him was popping up with musket balls that were being fired at him. So to answer your question, Lee was hands on. A Civil War commander had to be there, because this was an age before radios. And it was an age that when a battle took place, there was lots and lots of smoke. We hear about the fog of war. And basically with all the black powder concerned, after the first few volleys there was very little to be seen and so a civil war commander relied on his ears more than his eyes and Lee would ride up and down the lines trying to hear where the, the fighting was going on so yet yeah, Lee was very hands on and put himself in harm's way. Any other questions? See when it came to the, uh, to the end of the civil war did, did the south surrender on the civil war? Did they have a chat and did they, did they 
Well, if I had time, I would have loved to have chatted a wee bit more about this, and it's actually another lecture in itself. So we'll invite you back a third time, you might hear that. <laughs> what happened? Just a quick answer then. Okay. I'll give you a quick answer. What happened was that at Appomattox, Appomattox Courthouse, basically Lee had extended his supply lines. They had no food. He had requested Richmond to send them food, and he had sent out uh, his men around the countryside to try and gather in food. The wagons came back empty. And Lee knew that he was done. And so he, he approached General Ulysses S. Grant for terms of surrender. Now Grant had a reputation of giving no quarter. Unconditional surrender. However Grant was very generous to Lee. And he offered Lee very favourable terms. And that was that if Lee would sign parole and his men would sign parole that was to go home and promise not to fight against the Union, that he would allow them to leave with their horses. He didn't even request the officers to hand in their sabres. And this was a very symbolic act. However, what Lee didn't know that Grant had also outstripped his supply lines. And that if Lee had hung on, possibly, and had time and men and enough for another push, Grant was planning not to pursue Lee, but to turn and go back to the north. So to answer your question, Grant gave very favourable uh, very favourable conditions to Lee upon surrender. However, later on, when the civilian government got involved, it was a different case, and they started a witch hunt uh, for Lee and the rest of the Confederates, which is an interesting lecture in its own, I just have you know. But anyway, any other questions? Is Edinburgh confiscated in Northern Ireland? Yes, uh, Lee, Lee, it actually wasn't Lee's land, it was his, his wife's land, yes. Mary Custis, mm -hmm. although Lee administered it. Arlington House sat opposite Washington. In fact, you could stand in Arlington and look over to the Capitol. And this is one of the things and problems that Lee had, that um, he knew that when the Civil War started, that the, the Federals, the Northerners, would be very quickly in his front garden. And in fact, as the war started, it's really interesting to read his letters, because he writes to Mary and he says, look, pack the house up, get ready, move to safety, try and get as much as you can. And to answer your question, yes, they confiscated Arlington House. I can't remember which general it was, but to add insult into injury, he purposely buried Union soldiers in the grounds and uh, the front garden, basically, of Arlington House. And this is a way of ensuring that Lee would never, ever gain a residency again in Arlington House. Now Lee fought throughout his life to have Arlington restored back to their family or to be compensated for the house. I think it was actually after his death, I, I can't remember just, this is something I'd have to look up, when basically I think the family was given some compensation. But yes, Arlington was lost to Lee and he loved Arlington dearly. That's basically how the, the cemetery turned into a, yeah, a, a military cemetery. Uh, and it was basically done, some believe, out of spite to Robert E. Lee. Yeah, There's a lot, and it's a, a large military. It's a national park. Uh, in fact, uh, this year I was in correspondence with Arlington House and uh, I've got a lot of help from Arlington. I'm doing a piece on Robert E. Lee. I'm writing about his faith uh, and his honour code and how that shaped him as a man and a general. And the people in Arlington were fantastic and really excited that somebody in Ireland was actually interested in Robert E. Lee. So, yeah. Anybody else? Did, they have, did his wife? They have a plantation. Um, you know, when they had to leave Arlington, where did they all go? Right. His family. 
where have they ended? After the war, Robert E. Lee uh, came back to Richmond. They were living in a small rented house. Lee had lost his fortune because he had saved and he had a bit of land that was left him, not a lot of land, but a bit of land that was left him from his mother. His wife had lost everything. The Lees had nothing. They were living in a small rented house in Virginia and it is said that Lee came back with one wagon painted with U.S. wrote on the side of it. It wasn't even a Confederate wagon. Uh, a couple of outriders who were his general staff, uh, a couple of his sons, and walked in a crowd, gathered outside the house. Lee dismounted traveller, again his, his formal, honourable persona. Uh, he bowed deeply to the crowd and he walked up the steps and closed the door behind him. But that man was going through hell. He had lost it including his citizenship. Lee was actually never ever awarded a parole. There was a problem with Lee's parole. Not least that they tried to try him for treason, but there was two things needed to have a parole. First of all, you had to send uh, an application for parole, and second of all, you had to send an affidavit that you had been witness taking a oath of allegiance to uh, the federal government. Lee sent in his application without his oath. He then went and, realising his mistake, sent in his oath without his application. And whoever got it, threw it in a drawer, and it stayed there. And I think it was something, possibly like 1970 or 1960, that Lee actually got a full pardon. So, there we go. How long did he live that? Oh, uh, Lee lived about another five years or so. I uh, forget his. I uh, forget. I don't know. Uh, again, another lecture. Lee did fantastic things after the war. I'll not tell you about them. He lived to 1870. What family did he have? Ooh, Lee had quite a big family. I couldn't name them all. Um, he had a number of boys, a uh, number of girls. His favourite. Daughter Annie died and crippled him. And it talked about how he cried over Annie. And again, his faith kicks in here because I think he said about Annie that uh, he wrote a letter to Mary Lee and he, he said along the ways that if there was anyone in our family that was to die and he would be sure that they'd be in heaven the day, then it was Annie. He also loved his daughter in law Charlotte deeply. Uh, she was married to Rooney Lee. Rooney Lee had been wounded. And he was recuperating in a farmhouse. His mother, Mary Custis, was there. His younger brother, Robert Jr., was there. The Federals found out that he was there. Robert managed to escape by the skin of his teeth. The northerners went in, dragged him out of his sick bed in front of his wife, Charlotte. Charlotte was never the same again. Charlotte became very ill. Again, she had fragile health. And she eventually died and it's said that Robert writes a lovely letter and he talks in it about how, how he loved her as a daughter uh, and, and how he cried when he heard of, of her passing but that they would have to go on, would have to do their duty. In all this, Lee never gets home. Lee's at the front. Lee never gets home. It isn't like today that in a sense in a war where a soldier has, has post-traumatic stress syndrome or somebody dies at, at their home and, and there's compassion leave. Like of John, uh, like, like of Longstreet, uh, children died of scarlet fever. I think of scarlet fever, yellow fever. Longstreet stayed at the front. Never the same again, never the same man again, but he couldn't go home. Invite me back for, oh, well, last question. Can you go way back to the beginning when you talked about the door some man whether it was his grandfather or that that left the estate to the daughter? Yes. Was that unusual? Because they were, I think you said they were sons as well. Yeah. Um, I think it's unusual because normally back then you would have left it to the nearest surviving male heir. 
he left it to Matilda. Now Matilda, he had left it to his son, but his son died. And then Matilda was the next in line for this. However, Matilda was very, very astute. She knew what her husband was like, and she didn't want him getting her hands fully on her estate. And so she left the estate to her son Henry. Lighthorse Harry Lee had the estate until then, so he could live in it, look after it. By all accounts, while he had it, he sold most of it off. He mortgaged most of it. He wasn't the kind of man that you would want to come to your house to sell you insurance, but it like that. <laughs> well, what she was trying to do, she was basically trying to hold on to her little bit of, of inheritance that she had. And so that is how that family was taken out. But no, I would agree with you. It's, it's strange that... But no, it seems that, that maybe in, in American law it was more lax and that women could inherit. Enlightened. Enlightened. Yeah, enlightened's a good word. Yeah, 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 yeah. That because, you know, you find that uh, Mary Custis inherits her father's estate. Uh, and so you find this, this. So very quickly, we have Roy here. Invite me back if you want to ask some more questions or if you want to speak to me afterwards.